Yes, very sad the state of uh, Gaza today. Will take a long time to rebuild. And it's very sad that many people have been killed. But this is what happens when you cross into Israel, when you butcher civilians, when you rape women, when you mutilate babies, and when you take Israelis hostage. There will be no excuse and no pardon for any of the Hamas leaders. This is a Visegrad 24 series about the Israel-Hamas war. We are in Tel Aviv with Jonathan Conricus, uh, former spokesman of the IDF and currently senior fellow at FDD, a think tank in Washington. Welcome. Thank you. We are now well into three months, almost four months uh, into the war against Hamas. How would you say that um, the general atmosphere in Israel has changed over this time? Naturally, the first week or two, uh, there was a lot of shock, but uh, it seemed that the Israelis were very quick to pick themselves up on the feet and uh, get going, start going to work, so to say. We saw these planes full of Israelis coming back to, to Israel, um, willing to join the reserves and uh, quickly uh, taking up arms and also civil society starting to uh, gather all types of equipment and other help that is, is needed. How would you say that it is now three months in? Yes, well, first of all, hello, shalom, thank you for having me here. I'd say that it is a society in a country in trauma, uh, where by the effects of the trauma, I think that there's the immediate effect that you spoke about, you know, the immediate response where it was a all hands on deck situation and everybody in Israel understood it and everybody wanted to do something useful. So whether it's uh, those who were needed and in combat age and with combat uh, equipment and background to enlist uh, to the reserves and be ready. Uh, many flew from halfway around the world at their own expense, some of them with help, but basically got here as fast as possible because everybody understood that after the atrocious attacks of October the 7th, we would find ourselves at war and it would only be a matter of time before ground troops would be, would be needed. Civil society got involved, and there's these been you know wonderful examples of involvement, of contribution, of volunteering. Many of the ugly and, in my mind, very unnecessary political tensions and polarization that have really been, I'd say, staining Israeli society for the last year or so before October the seventh, they were pushed aside. We can have a discussion of where they are now and whether or not they're coming back into the political and the general discourse. But in general, they were pushed aside because of the necessity to come together and to fight a very serious evil that has been unleashed on Israel and the potential of additional fronts opening up, Hezbollah in the north um, specifically. So we've seen coming together and we've seen enlistment um, I think that today, where we are, more than, I think we're on the 107th day of fighting. You know, if you walk around in Tel Aviv, <clears throat> as I'm sure that you have, and if you're on Israeli roads, you'll see that there's lots of traffic in Tel Aviv, I'd say almost back to normal in terms of density, which means that people are going to work and that the economic engine of the state of Israel is at least partially in movement. But many parts of Israel, they're a war zone. Up in the north, it looks very different. Yeah. Very, totally different. And if you go to the, the south, ghost towns uh, that have been evacuated of Israeli civilians, 100,000 Israelis from the south have been evacuated from their homes. Many of them ha don't have homes to go back to, and about 100,000 from the north. Many of them still have their homes. They have not been directly hit, but they're unsafe to live in, and they are in hotels uh, and in other temporary locations. So it's a very, Israel is many times it's a land of contrast. It's a land of great contrast and polarity. Uh, in Tel Aviv, you could be forgiven for thinking that it's business as usual here, but it's a very parallel universe in other places in, in, in Israel. But if to try to generalize and to, you know, to tell a story of what's happening overall in Israel, I'd say that it's a society reeling from trauma. It's a society that needs and is asking 
very difficult questions. Um, the whole bond or the agreement, the contract between country and state and the civilian, the, 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 the person, that contract, I think, based on what many Israelis feel, has been broken or violated by the government, by the military and by the security institutions. And many Israelis, I think, feel very much alone. Are you thinking in the, in the way that, in general, the attack could happen on October 7th or in any other way has it been violated? Yeah, the fact that it did happen, mm. uh, how it happened, the consequences of the attack and the, the, the tremendous size of it. Yeah. Uh, how long the terrorists were able to wreak havoc inside Israel, <clears throat> how many Israelis were murdered, how they were murdered. And then, of course, the fact that we are 108 days uh, into fighting and there's still more than 130 Israelis held as hostages. Um, I've also heard many Israelis speak uh, very sadly about the services that they've been provided. Some have very good experiences and some tell horrible stories of basically being left alone. And when we speak about Israeli society, it's, you know, it's a, it's a mix of it, but these are, uh, this is a traumatic experience that will, I think, uh, shape Israeli society for a long time ahead. The last time that Israel encountered something like this was uh, more than 50 years ago in Yom Kippur. But in the Yom Kippur War in 73, the failure and the disaster were focused on the military and had tremendous ramifications, but they were you know, contained in a military area. Mm. People in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Haifa, you know, yes, they had their sons and fathers mm. fighting there, but it wasn't civilians who were directly hit. Mm. In 2023, October 7, civilians. Mm. And that, I think, is a very, very big a difference, one that will take a lot of time to fix. Well, uh, Hamas is almost now recognized by all uh, countries, at least in, in the Western world, as a terrorist organization. Uh, and the character of the attack on October 7th had that clear terrorist component that they were targeting civilians and they did um, perpetrate unspeakable atrocities. But there is also a tendency uh, among some anti-Israeli voices in the West uh, and in the Middle East as well to try to portray Hamas as a legitimate military force uh, because according to the international rules of warfare uh, technically if you're a rebe rebellion group if you put on some form of uh, insignia on yourself and, and you do uh, fight within the rules of, of, of uh, legal warfare then you should also be treated as a legal combatant um, but uh, how would you describe what is the, 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 the character, the nature of, of Hamas? I think that I agree with what you're saying, and I think it is absurd. And the, I'd say the psychological human need for parity, mm -hmm. to create some kind of parity and balance. There's one side fighting, and then there's the other side, and they're different, and, uh, but they're both fighting. That's how many have been describing uh, and uh, a lot of the media coverage has been about this, but uh, I think in, in, it is, it's perverse to put Israel and Hamas on an even keel and to draw comparisons between us, I think is morally perverse. And I think it is extremely regrettable that there have been statements in my mind, uh, tremendously dangerous and uh, ill-advised statements by senior elected and appointed officials around the world who have justified indirectly or sometimes directly the crimes against humanity that Hamas has done and created some kind of parity between uh, previous Israeli actions or future Israeli actions before they even happen and what Hamas did on October the 7th. Um, context, not out of a vacuum, etc. And many other statements that I think belong in the pantheon of, uh, of immoral statements and reckless statements made by uh, elected and appointed officials. And the, uh, what I think is another issue which is many times overlooked is, you know, we, we operate according to rules that the world set into place after probably the biggest catastrophe uh, in modern history, the, the Holocaust and the Second World War. And then the world said, well, let's 
let's uh, try to uh, apply some laws to the most horrible human endeavor, and that's war. So you can do this and this and this, but you cannot do this and this and this, and if you have to do this and this, then there are certain preconditions, etc. So we're fighting now in 2023 and 4 with the same rules that were uh, drafted then, which fit to a certain extent the scenery and the uh, players, so to say, the uh, fighting parties of the Second World War. Today, what I find the most challenging is the distinction between combatant and non-combatant. Um, I think that our enemies, specifically Hamas, are using this, utilizing it in an incredibly creative and conducive way from their point of view. They are milking every drop of international legitimacy and support, using Palestinian blood as the vehicle in order to do that. Yet on the other hand, uh, are, have no responsibility and accountability for their actions. Nobody holds them responsible for anything that they do or anything that they don't do, contrary to Israel and contrary to any other combatant. And the, it is very difficult if today you take a scholar who, let's say, never heard about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and you present to him how Hamas, what Hamas is, how they are deployed inside Gaza, what the, how, how intertwined Hamas is in, in Palestinian society, um, what type of infrastructure they use, who are the personnel who fight there, and how do they fight with or without uniforms. And mm -hmm. they fight without uniforms. Uniforms are for parades and, mm -hmm. and uh, propaganda movies, fighting in civilian clothes and civilian shoes. But when you do a, a, a complete analysis... And without insignia. Of course, without insignia, uh, and you see it, see it even in Hamas videos. They'll see a guy, show a guy in uh, sweatpants and uh, hoodies and s uh, sneakers running out uh, on the street, firing an RPG, Allahu Akbar, and then running back. When or if and when he gets killed, he'll be killed in civilian clothes. Uh, and I'm sure that the Palestinian health ministry, the Gaza health ministry, will write him down and it will be reported in international media as a... 22-year-old Palestinian man who was killed by Israeli forces. Why was he killed? What was the context? We will never know. But if you present Hamas and a Gazan society to a scholar who has no bias before, I think that he would have a very diff he or she would have a very difficult time in understanding who is a combatant and who isn't a combatant. A family of non-combatants who housed Israeli hostages up in their attic while the woman was on the UNRWA payroll. Is she a combatant or is she not a combatant? Is the house military infrastructure? It was used for military objectives. So according to international law, it's uh, a credible uh, military target. There's a military purpose for it. But then again, it's a family house. There are kids and women there. By the way, the women was the hostage keeper. So I think that what we're seeing now, and this is kind of a big picture thing, at the end of this war, this will be another war where, which will probably force the international community and those who deal in uh, the laws of armed conflict to reevaluate and to redefine or at least to update what is a combatant and what isn't a combatant and how democracies and uh, militaries of nation states can continue to defend themselves against this very uh, hybrid and shape-shifting threat that we're seeing with Hamas. I think Hamas has taken Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, Islamic Jihad and, and many other organizations to a higher level when it comes to using the civilian infrastructure and civilians for their military purpose and blurring the lines between, In between them all. In your former role as spokesman of, of the IDF, you dealt with a lot of journalists from across the world. Um, did you feel that a lot of them were maybe not specialized in military conflicts and warfare, that it was difficult to have this type of conversation with them because they simply did not have the necessary knowledge? 
what I felt, you know, it's a breaking news event. So uh, it's big news and for them, for media organizations, for TV stations, etc. it's uh, all hands on deck. And even people with no or very limited military knowledge are called to do a job. I can understand that and I can respect the situation that a presenter or an anchor would be in. What I found reg regrettable is that even people with extremely limited um, knowledge of the Middle East, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, about counterterrorism, counter etc., had very strong views. Very strong views and they had like a cookie cutter system whereby things that are said by Israel in general, by me as a military spokesperson or by other Israelis, that should always be questioned and that should be allegedly or according to Israelis and that information that we provide must be verified and if it wasn't seen by the report of the BBC or whatever it was then it couldn't be independently verified which is all fine but then I saw that the same practices were not applied to information provided by the other side. Up until this day very few people speak about the whole media landscape in Gaza. How is information generated and then uh, broadcast to the world? The system that Hamas has been able to shape according to their own interest is that they have physical and psychological in powers of intimidation over Western media or the representatives of Western media in Gaza. How does it work? Since it's much nicer to live here in Tel Aviv than it is to live in Gaza or in Ramallah. International media are based in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. Many have offices in Jerusalem, like the beach in Tel Aviv, and enjoy living in Israel. Nice restaurants, nice weather, and it's relatively safe and welcoming. And in Gaza, stringers work. Who are the stringers? Palestinians. Palestinians with families. Palestinians that are... Uh, under the influence. They may not be Hamas supporters and they may not be uh, jihadists in soul and ideas, but they are under the influence and they can be influenced by Hamas. And I've seen this time and time again. Whenever there is reporting that isn't to the liking of Hamas in international media, one of the agencies, AP, AFP, Reuters, New York Times, BBC, everybody, anybody who has a stringer there, if the reporting isn't to the liking of Hamas, then there is retribution. There's a warning. Second time, there's retribution. And people learn. Reporters and stringers, they learn that, okay, if we want to live and continue to work without uh, our family being uh, targeted or killed or me myself being targeted, then I'll do what Hamas tells me to do. So no reporting of how Hamas is using UNRWA schools, no reporting of how they're firing from mosques, no reporting on how they're using children and civilians as human shields, no reporting on the tunnels, no reporting on where the hostages were taken and how they were brought into hospitals and then uh, brought out. Nothing that is inconvenient for Hamas is shared at a real level by international media. Uh, but only the stories that are more or less convenient. And I think that's really a shame because people around the world, if they rely on accredited and established media, which most of us would like to trust and say, well, I read it in AP or it says Reuters reported or the New York Times, then I'd like to believe that it's true. What I know from my personal professional experience is that no, it isn't. This is what has been approved by Hamas to be reported from Gaza and then it goes through a journalist and then there's editing etc and eventually at the end of it the product that a consumer sees or reads or watches isn't really reality reflected but it's a version that is convenient for Hamas. And uh, if we look apart from the journalist core there is also the the general street so to say we have the Arab street famously here in the Middle East uh, but now we could also say that we have the street in the Western world, in, in, in Europe, in the US. And if we compare, for example, to with, with the previous uh, military operation in Gaza in 2014, uh, it seems that we've never had this much uh, emotions swirling. Mm -hmm. um, there are different theories that maybe it is the social media landscape and how it has changed, especially TikTok has been blamed for, for a lot of this. Other people say that 
something has happened at our universities that has led the way of making especially young people very anti-Israeli. Um, but when you see these marches in London, Paris and Washington and other cities, tens of thousands, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of people that very easily fall into these chants of from the river to the sea or uh, another one you hear is um, uh, there is only one solution, Intifada revolution. Mm -hmm. Lately we have Yemen, Yemen, make us proud, turn another boat around. Yeah. Th these seem to be very, very radical slogans, but they are bought by the large masses. How does that make Israelis feel in general? And how does that make you feel when you see these pictures? You know, Israel, the way I analyze it is Israel, for various reasons, is on the wrong side of progressive, liberal, cool, and uh, in vogue, okay? There's this line that separates, and for various reasons, some of it is Israel's doing, but a lot of it isn't. Some of it is old, deep-seated anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, etc. Some of it is related to Israeli policies, etc. But at the end of the day, factually, I think that we are, we find ourselves on the wrong side of that uh, watershed line. What I am saddened by, on one, one aspect of it, I am saddened by it because I see people who, as you describe them, I don't think that there are many of them who participate in many of these rallies are essentially evil or bad or very nefarious people who want to kill Jews or Israelis. I, I'm sure that many of them believe that they're marching for something that is just and that they're just revolting against oppression or doing something that they believe is, uh, is a just cause. Uh, I'm sure that many of them are, um, have that they harbor very evil thoughts and feelings towards Israel and Jews, but I'll put those aside. And I think that it's fascinating to see how quickly people are willing to uh, go to extremes and say extreme things and be part of, let's say, an extreme environment um, without feeling even a little bit ashamed. I was shocked when I saw quite a lot of videos online taken by pro-Israelis who were filming young people many places around the world, but in the US, tearing down posters of kidnapped Israeli women and children and men. And then they, the filmers, peacefully, without any physical contact, confronted them and said, why are you doing this? Why, why, what justification do you have for tearing down posters of civilians that were kidnapped in their pajamas from their homes? What's the justification? And they, I never saw any answer, but I saw people who were totally okay with being filmed and uh, tearing down posters of, of uh, kidnapped civilians. And it's interesting to see that, you know, it's, this is, it's a very extreme thing to do, which I wouldn't be comfortable doing. Even, you know, even if the children of, uh, I don't know, uh, Ismail Haniya, um, or whomever else who isn't part of a conflict or is, isn't really, why would I, wh why would that, why would they do that? What it, how I feel that it influences Israeli civilians, again reflected through mass media, Israeli media, is I think sadly uh, an image of um, continued bias, hatred and anti-Semitism which I think is unfortunate. Uh, here, I wish that, you know, media in general and Israeli media would be less sensational. Um, I think that, you know, from the thousands of people that I speak with, there's lots of support for Israel. There's lots of support for Israel, for what we're doing, for how we're defending ourselves, for the justness of our cause. But that doesn't sell clicks and it doesn't make news headlines, but a convoy of 300,000 Muslims chanting death to the Jews and Intifada in London makes headlines. Uh, and that is unfortunate because it makes Israelis feel, I think, many in general, something that isn't really reality. Um, mm. And it, it, it also stokes, I would say, fear, anger and hatred within Israel towards people, uh, other people, which never, is never a good thing. Uh, but it, it also, on the positive side, it kind of exposes people for uh, who they really are. Um, and when you see politicians, Corbyn for one, 
simply physically unable to call Hamas terrorists, then it really, you know, after October the 7th, uh, having been asked 14 times, uh, are they terrorists or not, then it really, you know, uh, disposes of a lot of masks and, and you get the sense of what really people believe in and what they stand for. Um, so that is uh, a good thing. I think personally that, uh, you know, the slogans, they're very good when it comes to uh, uh, creative and, and copywriting, but I don't think that they're very strategically smart. And I think that many in Europe uh, and in the US see these kind of mass demonstrations and shows of force by Muslims, by pro-Hamas, anti-Israelis or pro-Palestinians, it's a mix. And they see it and I don't think that many people really like it. And uh, that many people wake up in London and say, well, this isn't what I want to see on my streets. These aren't the kind of values that <clears throat> I think represent my society. And even if I'm not a big fan of Israel, I'm sure as not a big fan of Hamas and what they've done and what they're doing, not against Israelis and not against Palestinians. And um, the fact that they are <clears throat> so vocal, so aggressive, so out in your face uh, and so blunt in their extremism, uh, I think that will have a negative effect on them. I think that will be shown in elections and where we will see results, we will see a pushback. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we're already seeing it in various European countries, but we'll see pushback uh, against that level of extremism, against that open su support for acts of terrorism and crimes against humanity that were portrayed and are, are done by Hamas. And uh, strategically, I'm not quite sure that their, let's say, popular level of support is a very good thing for them. You mentioned Jeremy Corbyn here, and it seems to be a little bit of a theme in Europe, at least, in America, it's less uh, influential, but in Europe we have seen over the past four or five decades a long process of mass immigration from North Africa and the Middle East. And in general, those voters have been leaning toward the Social Democratic Party in, in the UK, Labour. Uh, in Spain, we had another example with Pedro Sanchez, who was on the left and took a very anti-Israeli stance. Uh, in our hometown, Malmo, um, Barack Obama was forced to send, send his representative uh, in the fight against anti-Semitism yeah. back in 2008, I even think, to, because Malmo had received a reputation with a social democratic um, mayor who also mis made statements that were very inflammatory. Um, and of course, we remember in Iran in uh, 1979 with, with the revolution, you had this alliance between the red and the black, as, as some, some term it. Do you think that some of these politicians that make these statements, that maybe they themselves, they don't really hold this uh, conviction or idea, but they feel that for electoral purposes, it benefits them to take a strong anti-Israeli stance? For mysterious, mysterious reasons that I cannot explain uh, analytically, Israel is of interest. Israel and Jews are a topic of interest for many people around the world. Doesn't make really sense, doesn't make economic sense, doesn't make geopolitical sense. Uh, it's really difficult to, you know, uh, professionally and, and uh, analytically explain why do so many people care about our conflict. There are about 200 current ongoing conflicts or disputes of territory between different ethnic groups as we're speaking, none of them get as much attention, not only now fighting in Gaza, none of them has gotten so much attention that our 75, officially 75 years, years of conflict have. So Israel and the conflict is an issue, and it's a great way probably to get free, free publicity and to try to curry votes and favor uh, with local electorates. You know, the, the flag of the Houthis right, is uh, Allahu Akbar, death to America, death to Israel, curse upon the Jews, and victory to Islam. The last Jew left Yemen, was forced out of Yemen, more than 75 years ago. They, most of the people there have never seen a Jew. They've maybe seen Jews on TV, yet it's still on their flag, 
death to the Jews. Death to Israel, which is one thing, and then cursed be the Jews is the second thing. And I ask myself, why? They're 2,000 kilometers away. We don't share a border. We have never been there. We've never conquered. We never had any conflict with them. We've never sent a, a, a spy plane, maybe. But we've never really had any, any uh, conflicts with, with the Houthis or with, with Yemenites. What do they care about Israel? And same thing could be said about European politicians, both those, some of them that are openly in favor of Israel, and many who are using it as a uh, electoral bullet point uh, against Israel. Why is that the case? I have no idea, but uh, we're definitely seeing that, you know, I'm, as an Israeli, I look at it and I many times I ask myself, why do you really care about uh, what's going on here? Why does a Spanish foreign minister or uh, um, prime minister feel compelled to weigh in on, on this conflict? What has Spain uh, have anything to say or do about this conflict? Um, and why so much aid and money and influence provided to fuel uh, what's going on here? But um, at the end of at the end of it, you know, it's it's whether Israelis like it or not, it's a fact. And Israelis can either deal with it and try to make the best of the situation or complain. Usually, complaining doesn't do a lot of good. Uh, so Israel has to face it. Israel has to reach out work diplomatically, work in terms of, let's say, public information, public affairs, and make our voice heard, and try the best we can to um, compel many people to at least give us a fair hearing. And I'm, again, and this is a very subjective, non-scientific uh, point of view that I have, I'm, I am seeing and feeling a lot of support for Israel. Uh, it's not reflected through editors uh, and in newsrooms. We are not there yet, and it's not in many elites around the world. Um, in, in the US, uh, what's derogatorily referred to as coastal elites, I don't believe in the term, but uh, the big cities, etc. We may not be very favorably uh, presented there. But in many places, I think that there's a lot of support for Israel. People understand what it is that we're fighting for, why we're fighting, and why we don't have a choice but to fight, and very importantly, to win. Speaking here about the Houthis in Yemen, uh, there is a certain connection actually to Iran. Iran has had close relations with the Houthis ever since they burst onto the scene. Um, Hezbollah and Iran famously also have very tight, tight relations. Uh, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, this other proxy group is clearly Iranian uh, connected. And Hamas for the last 15 years or so, its main sponsor has been uh, Iran. Previously, Saudi Arabia and some other uh, Gulf states played a bigger role, but um, Iran seems to be this octopus, you could say, whose tentacles you see all across the region. Uh, and actually, uh, they have been having this ambition, at least unofficially, but clearly uh, to become a nuclear power now for quite a while. Um, how would you say that Israel's relationship is with Iran and what should be done with Iran long term? Yeah, I think that you know, I'll use a term or a catchphrase that was coined by uh, Mark Dubovitz from the FTD. He spoke about a mass... Uh, diversion, uh, the Houthis and Hezbollah, and to some extent Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in Gaza, uh, are a diversion, a mass diversion, so that the Iranians can achieve weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the Iranians, I, the Iranian regime, not the people, I know very little about the people, I know little about the regime, I think tremendous respect for their strategy, they're evil and they're on the wrong side, but I have tremendous respect for their strategy and how they have put in place a very uh, interesting and dynamic, um, shall we call it, playing board with different pieces which are happy to be used by Iran in order to further Iranian strategy and uh, ambitions. Um, and I think that the Iranians, if in the past we thought about, you know, the Soviet Union as 
uh, campaigners able to do information campaigns and or operational planning, uh, subversive activities, etc. I would say that Iran has taken the Soviet textbook and written a few new and very good chapters in the book of subversion. And today they are the world best in the world when it comes to building, funding, equipping and guiding and using proxies uh, for their own purposes with minimal exposure for themselves. Uh, their aim, I think, is to be a regional superpower, a regional power, and they understand, and I think correctly, that a very good way of doing that, perhaps the best way, is to have a nuclear umbrella. You don't, they don't even have to have a functioning nuclear weapon, missiles, and ability to deliver it, but a nuclear umbrella is a very powerful thing. And in order to achieve that, they have understood and said, yes, we're willing to pay prices and to give sacrifices. We will live with that, and that's fine. If it's sanctions and if it's other things that are imposed on Iran, the state, the regime, etc., we'll take it. And in order to promote our ability to shape the environment, we're going to fund and use uh, different um, ethnic minorities and different armed groups in the Middle East as proxies. Hezbollah was the first one, and it's really the jewel, the crown jewel of the Iranian empire of evil. Very well funded, very well trained, very ideologically strict and coherent. Um, and they are doing, they have done a tremendous job at really taking control of a country, of, of Lebanon. Uh, Hamas has different roots, but has also fallen under the Iranian fold. It retains some level of independence, but as the years go by, if there is a future for Hamas, let's say if they hadn't done October the 7th, then I think they would have gone more and more towards Iran. I don't think that there will be a, any significant future for, for Hamas, but that is uh, how they were. Um, and I started with the issue of diversion, because on the really big picture today, I think Iran can be very, very happy. Nobody is really speaking in earnest and not, a, not any significant diplo uh, diplomatic or brain power is focused on uh, nuclear Iran, on their ballistic missiles, on the enrichment, on the violations of the previous agreement uh, and on what they're doing. And they're probably, as we speak, busy at work with that, industriously and focused, busy at work, while the world is talking about um, uh, shipping routes through Africa, around Africa instead of in the Suez Canal and how much more expensive and how longer it will be for me to get my stuff on Amazon, uh, they are working towards the achievement of their strategic goals. And um, I think that it's not only about what Israel needs to do with Iran, but I think that Israel, the US, and perhaps a few other countries around the world have a shared interest of making sure that the Iranian strategy fails and doesn't become a reality. If and when a nuclear uh, Iran becomes equipped with nuclear military capabilities, that will be very challenging and I think it will ignite a weapons race in the region uh, whereby the Saudis, the Egyptians, perhaps the Turks and perhaps others would feel compelled to do the same uh, and that could be a very, very dangerous thing. And on top of that, of course, the nuclear umbrella would allow, probably allow Iran to become even more emboldened to promote even more violence and terrorism all over the Middle East. None of these things are good. Uh, there are varying points of view whether this can, if we've crossed the point of no return. Uh, and I've heard experts who are or very knowledgeable say that we've already crossed the point and some say that we are close but we have not yet. I don't know enough uh, but I think that action should be taken and uh, it would be I think fitting that global leaders uh, instead of looking at you know one or two threes zoom out and look at the forest and understand you know really what's what's at stake here and not allow Iran to get away with what they're doing. Uh, you called Hezbollah here the crown jewel of, of the Iranian regime and a lot of people are now focusing on Hezbollah and the prospect of 
uh, another campaign uh, in the north of Israel or south of Lebanon where we have had a at least low intense um, war going on in, since October 7th with anti-tank missiles being fired across the border, artillery shelling, drones from time to time also intruding in Israeli airspace. How, how likely do you think that there will be a, um, a, a an, another front that opens? Maybe once the IDF has taken control of of uh, of the Gaza Strip, uh, do you believe that there will be a second stage with a conflict with Hezbollah in the north? So we're at the end of January, and uh, maybe by the time this is uh, this interview is brought to the world, maybe the situation will be different. I, f I fear it may be, um, not because I want it. Uh, as an Israeli, as someone who sees the future of his children and grandchildren is the, in this country, I, uh, I definitely don't want war. I know that such a war with Hezbollah would be, by orders of magnitude, much more bloody and ruinous on Israel than what we're facing now in uh, Gaza against Hamas. Having said that, there are a few things that I think are non-negotiable uh, when it comes to the situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hezbollah. The fact that they have been attacking Israel, and Israel has been responding uh, since October the 8th, October the 8th, October the 9th, uh, 9th um, is, that is, that's clear. And so far, the two sides, both Hezbollah and Israel, have been quite measured and quite strategic in their actions. None of the sides have really escalated and given and, let's say, forced the other side to, to escalate more. But in general, we're seeing a steady, slow and steady escalation in the amount, the lethality and the range of rockets or weapons that Hezbollah is using towards Israel and Israel responding in kind. Of course, Israel is very far from using even a tenth of its capacities uh, that uh, Israel has. But at the end of the day, it's a very combustible situation. The non-negotiable part is that there are more than 100,000 Israelis who are not in their homes. And if you go north, you'll see that there are, as I said, ghost towns, where there's military out in the areas in between, and then a skeleton crew of five or 10 men in uh, each community. Women and children, and most of the men have left. And uh, families, you know, houses are, are, are ruined and businesses are ruined and Israeli communities are empty, forced out. There's a certain time limit on how long Israel can conduct itself like that and force its civilians out of their homes. Um, and at some stage, and I think that we are, as we're speaking, we're nearing the tipping point or a decision point, Israel will have to make a decision whether or not to um, admit or say that the diplomatic efforts that have so far been, let's say, the hope of Israel and perhaps the US and a few others, how to avoid a regional war. A lot of diplomatic efforts have been done, led by the Americans, but with French involvement, German involvement, a little bit of, we can call it assistance by the UN or not interfering. And there, there's been a lot of efforts done all of it based on the understanding that if a diplomatic solution isn't found, one that ensures the safety of Israelis to live in their homes south of the internationally recognized border, then Israel will have to do it differently. And Israel has been working behind the scenes in order to, to, to make that a reality. So far without success, and I hear worrying reports of the ability of the American negotiator and others to make advances in Lebanon, and I'm worried about that, because if that won't happen, Israelis still need to go to the, back to their homes. And they can only go back to their homes once it is safe. If it won't be safe by the uh, help of diplomacy, it will be safe by the help of military force, of kinetics. Now, kinetics is bloody, messy, violence, suffering, wounded, killed, and destruction and impact on the economy, and I don't know how many generations it will take for Lebanon to rebuild itself after uh, such a war, if at all. It's definitely something that Israel would like to avoid and so far has acted in order to avoid. 
But every day that goes by, there's additional pressure inside Israel. I think leaving the military and most importantly the government, the cabinet, with very few venues to approach and very few things to say. At the end of the day, Israelis need to go back to their homes. And if they're not able to do so, then that is a situation which the government cannot sustain. Uh, and no government should be able to uh, agree with that. I uh, think that the IDF has, is preparing, has been preparing and is preparing uh, to um, uh, meet that challenge. The first stages, of course, will be uh, heavy reliance on the Air Force. And Israel has everything that it needs in order to deliver a tremendously heavy blow to Hezbollah. Sadly, there will be a lot of damage uh, to infrastructure in Lebanon. Why? Because Hezbollah, similar to Hamas, maybe not at the same level, but similar to Hamas, uses civilian infrastructure and is embedded within the civilian population. Unlike Hamas, which doesn't have any or hardly has any independent locations, Hezbollah does have a few locations that are pure military in Baal Bek, Zahle area, in the Kalamun area, the mountain areas between Lebanon and Syria. Those are military locations that will be hit very, very hard and no civilians will be killed there. So nobody should be complaining about it. But in Beirut, in, in the Dahya and in southern Lebanon, all of the houses that Hezbollah is using um, in order to fire at the Israelis, they will be hit. And there will be consequences, uh, sadly, but there will be legitimate military targets. And at the end of such a war, which I hope doesn't happen, but if it does, Israel will still exist. Our economy will be impacted, but Israel will rebuild itself. And we will work and fight in order to um, replenish ourselves. I don't think that can be said about Lebanon. And I don't think it can be said about Hezbollah. And anybody who wants to avoid such a scenario should be hard at work in facilitating, I'd say, an implementation of 1701, UN Security Council Resolution 1701, to begin with. If that was implemented, I think we wouldn't be at the cusp of a regional war. Uh, a final question. Um, what would you say everything boils down to? If there is one thing that you could say to the general public especially in the West, those who don't have much knowledge about the conflict, but maybe have strong opinions. Uh, how would you try to somehow summarize to them or explain to them that this is what it comes down to? And this is why Israel is right in defending itself and Israel's position is, according to you, yeah. the right one. Even people with a lot of knowledge and opinions, I would say that uh, in this situation, I don't think that Israel has a choice. Living in this neighborhood, you know, I grew up in Sweden, so uh, I, we don't have Norway and Denmark as, a, as, as neighbors, or Finland. Uh, we, are, we are in many areas surrounded by entities of organizations that wish for the genocide of Jews and wish for the elimination of the state of Israel. Lots of people continuously ignore that. And many in Israel perhaps have been ignoring that as well. And that is how one of the reasons we uh, let down our guards and found ourselves at uh, the 7th of October with more than a thousand killed uh, civilians and more than 200 dead soldiers. We have no choice but to win. We have no choice but to defeat Hamas in a very decisive and clear way. First and foremost, to make sure that southern Israel can be safe to live in again, but also to send a message to all other terrorists in the region and around the world. Yes, very sad what uh, the, the state of uh, Gaza today it will take a long time to rebuild. And it's very sad that many people have been killed. But this is what happens when you cross into Israel, when you butcher civilians, when you rape women, when you mutilate babies, and when you take Israelis hostage. There will be no excuse and no pardon for any of the Hamas leaders, for the senior Hamas officials or terrorists. There will be no refuge for them. They need to be defeated without any buts and ifs. 
And Israel needs to do that. And all of our enemies need to see and understand that this is what happens. Um, hopefully, that will bring about an understanding that previous rounds of enemies already reached. You know, 60, 70 years ago, we were fighting Egyptians and Jordanians. Today, we have peace treaties with them, not because they have become believers in the Zionist idea, but because they tried three and four times to beat us on the battlefield and failed. They tried in 48 and 56, 67, 73, and then they said, okay, well, let's try something else. Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, all of the other Iranian proxies, I'm sure that they would love to destroy the state of Israel. We are not going to let them. And each and every one of them separately and as a collective need to understand that it is an exercise in futility and it is dangerous for the future. Hezbollah, Hamas will be the example that they will see and the others if they get involved as well. Jonathan, many thanks for coming on. Thank you.